And uh, I've already mentioned uh, Edwin and, and Melanie as being uh, really great technicians. Tom is my uh, graduate student. And then these other names up here, Brady, Tyler, Matt, and so on, are, they're all in italics. Those are uh, um, uh, college uh, interns that uh, we had work with us. And uh, this was actually their project. I just get the privilege of talking about it. So when we make a renewal cut, and this was a tenant of the slender spindle system before there was a tall spindle system, it goes back to, uh, to the Netherlands, and we call it a Dutch cut because it originated in the Netherlands. The earliest reference I can find to it is, a, is an extension bulletin uh, written uh, in the uh, Netherlands in 1968. And uh, it says that you want to make this cut with an upward facing bevel so that there's more tissue down here to encourage a wide crotch angle to encourage the branch to originate down here and give you a calm flat branch. So as it follows then, that, that upward facing bevel was said to be important because the renewal shoots were going to sprout underneath. That was going to give you a wide crotch angle and a calm flat branch. That requires a lot of effort. Uh, in order to bend down and make that cut, and, uh, or you have to train your crew to make that cut. And I got into a conversation with Dr. Peter Hurst at, at Purdue, and uh, our, our conversation moved on from the, the proper balance of barley, malt, and hops to, to uh, this pruning uh, question. And we asked each other, what's the scientific basis for this recommendation? Anybody ever do any science on that? Because we've all recommended it. I know Wynn has. I know I have. I know Terrence Robinson has. I bet you my colleagues out west have. We've all talked about this for generations. This is the Dutch cut. We all do it. Well, if you're trying to train some engineers who had never saw an apple tree before how to, how to design a pruning instrument, they need to know what kind of a cut to make. Do we need to include that as a rule for them? That would be an extra level of complexity that would probably take them an extra two years. So in this type of a tall spindle system, and these uh, trees were galas, uh, do we need to do this kind of a, a Dutch cut? We took uh, uh, 10 trees, gala, uh, Buckeye gala, mulling nine, uniform size and vigor trees, pruned them dormant. Treatments were applied uh, to about half inch diameter branches. Oh, son of a gun, half inch diameter branches. How about that? Um, and we did it with 10 replicates of each type of cut in 2014. We had some tantalizing data, which you'll see in a minute, that kind of suggested that, oh, it's close. We almost have significance here. So we, we increased the number of replicates, which is what a scientist does to try and tease out things that are close but no cigar. These are the kinds of cuts we made. We either made uh, two centimeter cuts, and the two centimeters refers to the, the shortest distance here. So. We did upward facing. I guess you could call those upside down Dutch cuts. Uh, I make those by accident once in a while. We did, uh, well, actually, that's the right kind. Then we did the downward facing ones, which is the wrong way. And then we also made some that were perpendicular, where that distance and that distance are about the same. We did that with either long stubs, which in this case are two centimeters, or short stubs, which in this case, that distance right there or this distance right here, would be half a centimeter, which is a very small uh, stub. We came back after the branches had had a chance to renewal, and we looked at these each one of these stubs we left end on, and we said, did they come out the top? Did they come out the sides? Or did the branches, the renewal branches, did they come out the bottom? And what's the length of them, and what's their angle? Zero being a horizontal flat one, which is desirable, or were, were they more upright? So what's the branch angle? This is the results from 2014. And you can scan all of that, or you can just look down here and see that the number of renewal shoots we got, their length and their angle was non-significant. There was no significant difference between the stub the different stub lengths or the kinds of cut we made. And that was uh, uh, the first year. Uh, we also looked at, uh, as I told you, we looked at these end on to see where, where did they come out? Did they come out the bottom, the top? And so 
here's the number that came out at the top, or, or the two position, or here's the, the numbers that came out the sides, here's the ones that came out down in the bottom part where we want it. For the most part, the results again were non-significant, except there was this one thing where stub length, it looked like with the longer stub, more of them uh, were coming out in that horizontal position. So we, as we told you, we increased the number of replicates in 2015 and, and uh, tried it again. And so here's the number of renewal shoots we got per stub cut. Here's the length uh, in centimeters. And here's the branch renewal angle. And you can see, again, no significant difference between long stubs and short stubs or whether the stubs were perpendicular or the proper Dutch cut or the upside down Dutch cut. No effect, two years in a row. And again, when we look at, remember that was supposed to encourage them to come out the bottom, but there was no significant difference from any of those treatments on where the branch came out. So, Stub length and cut angle don't matter. <laughs> and perpendicular cuts would be just as effective as, as uh, Dutch cuts for, for stimulating renewal branches. Here's a perpendicular cut, and there's actually this one's got two renewal branches. My personal opinion is that the short cuts are preferable to leaving a long stub. I would like to spend a second and just talk about fire blight. Um, some of our colleagues down at the University of Maryland, uh, Keatesville, uh, have a really bad fire blight situation. And, and they were talking about uh, this being a, a, uh, an issue. Um, and if you make renewal cuts, uh, the shoot originates close to the trunk, and uh, that could be bad for fire blight, which is true. It's very true. So to put this in perspective, so horticultural practice, horticultural practices generate revenue. Plant protection practices protect your investment and protect that revenue. Some horticultural old practices increase the risk. Renewal pruning, in this case, generates shoots close to the leader. If you have a trauma event, such as a hailstorm in June, which is what they had down in Katiesville, that can cause shoot blight, which can infect renewal shoots, which can result in a canker in the leader, and that is a risk. It's real. But, in my opinion, stub cuts are what we would call a horticultural necessity. So we do a number of things, if you think about it, that go against the rules that a plant pathologist would tell you if, if uh, they were going to tell you. We plant fire blight susceptible varieties on fire blight susceptible rootstocks. We plant them in close proximity. We bring bees in. We do annual pruning that invigorates and may spread the pathogen. We practice weed control, which can invigorate the host. And you know that fire blight loves a vigorous host. And we fertilize those trees. We shouldn't do any of those things if we want to mitigate fire blight, except that they are horticultural necessities. And so I would tell you that I think, in my opinion, uh, stub cuts are also uh, an acceptable risk in this case under normal circumstances. So you need to use all the practices at your disposal to, to have moderate vigor and reduce the susceptibility of your, of your trees. Suspend renewal pruning, uh, all pruning. If you have a, a high inoculum uh, uh, situation, bad fire blight block or, or a, uh, a trauma event that uh, is going to possibly cause fire blight to blow up, in those circumstances, you definitely should be using perhexadione calcium to reduce the susceptibility of those trees. And if you have a trauma event, uh, you're going to probably spray strep, and you should probably include a, a, a hefty dose of Apogee or perhexadione calcium uh, to reduce uh, the vigor of, of those things. I think I've pretty well used up most of my time. I did have one more uh, topic, but uh, I, I think it's less important than then maybe seeing if there's a question or two. Do I have a few minutes? Okay. 
hey, can you hold together? Can you can you stay seated for five more minutes? We'll we'll cover one more thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not pushing the right button here. Okay. Right. Okay. So we're going to talk now about this. Is we're going to shift our gears. Everything up till now has been pruning tall spindle mature trees. Now we're going to talk about increasing bud break and shoot growth of newly planted trees with notching and 6BA sprays. This grew out of a study done by uh, Dr. Steve McCartney before uh, he went to work for Valent while he was still at NC State uh, University. And this is attacking the issue of blind wood in uh, apple trees. In the nursery, and Wynn has done a lot of work on this, they use uh, sprays of Maxell uh, 6BA to stimulate side branches on actively growing young trees in the nursery. And when those trees are actively growing, they can spray 6BA, and at the appropriate time, it'll stimulate a flush of new feathers uh, to grow out, uh, and, it, and it works beautifully. Those kinds of sprays alone aren't adequate uh, once you get into a maturing situation, a mature tree situation in the orchard. So McCartney evaluated using notching, and we'll get into that, and 6BA sprays to increase bud break on blind wood. And he used using it on two-year-old wood on five-year-old trees. And he found some good results from using those combos. So my interns came in. We had one-year-old trees, and we wanted to encourage uh, new growth, new uh, wood growth on these whips. So these were whips. They were newly planted Fuji bud nine trees. We selected a section of wood that had five buds and uh, marked it. You'll see that in a second. And applied uh, different treatments and then came back and saw how many feathers we got to break on those trees. These are the treatments. We had an untreated control. We had trees that got 6BA sprays alone. We got 6BA sprays alone and then a follow-up spray of, of promalin after uh, bud break. Then we had trees that were notched and unsprayed, notched and uh, 6BA sprayed at the time of notching, or notched with a 6BA spray and a follow-up spray of promalin after the buds had broken. The timing on these things, the notching was applied about six weeks after planting when it was apparent that we had blind wood not breaking where we wanted it. We applied uh, 6BA immediately after the notching with a hand sprayer, and the promalin was about four or five weeks thereafter. We used a sawzall hacksaw blade, not the sawzall itself, just the blade, uh, to do the notching. You'll see a picture of that in a second. 6BA was applied immediately thereafter. And this is what it looked like. So here's our little, our little Fuji trees. We planted them. We did not head them. They branched out up at the top. But in this area where we wanted branches to break, they were not breaking. So we came in on some of them, and we notched them with a hacksaw blade. I like to use a hacksaw blade because it makes a little thicker cut than a knife does. That cut is slower to heal, and when we interrupt the apical dominance uh, for a longer period of time, it increases the probability that that bud will break underneath there. Then we sprayed uh, Maxell, 1,500 parts per million. Here's untreated. Here's treated with notching and spraying, and you can see it's a very high percentage of breaks that took place. And here's the take-home message. <clears throat> when we did not notch, we got very little uh, response to, uh, we, we got very little branching whatsoever, and adding 6BA and or promalin didn't increase that. When we notched, we got about 40% of those buds to break. When we notched and added a spray of 6BA um, immediately following the notching, we increased that, we doubled it. When we added 6BA, uh, when we added promalin three or four weeks later, in this particular instance, we did not increase the amount of branching uh, over and above what we got from just the, the 6BA at the time of notching. We also came in and looked at the little shoots, medium shoots, and, and bigger shoots. And essentially, when we notched and used Maxell, we had uh, more shoots in this longer 
uh, size range than if we did not. And when we added bromelain to that a little bit later, they were not longer than when we just used 6BA. So this is a little bit different result than what Steve McCartney found on five-year-old trees. On five-year-old trees, the follow-up spray of bromelain was necessary in order to get those branches to grow. And on these one-year-old newly planted trees, the follow-up spray of, of uh, bromelain was not necessary. But the spray of Maxell was very beneficial. So again, just uh, showing you uh, the test zone on uh, untreated. And then this is with 6BA. And you can see that 6BA, uh, I'm sorry, I take it back. This is with notching. Blue and white is notched. So notched, when we notched, we got, a, uh, we got branches to break. But you can see they stayed pretty small. When we notched and added 6BA, we got really nice feathers. You can see from this picture that when you interrupt apical dominance, you get an upright branch. And you would have to come in and do some limb spreading with clothespins or something like that to, to get them into the right shape. But now we have branches where before we had none. So, so that's the take home message for that talk.